All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so this is, uh, I'll be presenting today work that I've uh, done uh, primarily in collaboration uh, with uh, the, the sort of RIT Johns Hopkins NASA collaboration um, with Manuela Campanelli, Julian Krolik, Scott Noble, and others who are there now or were there shortly before in my prior postdoc. Um, now I'm at the Institute of Astronomy, uh, returning to some single black hole work with Chris Reynolds' group, but I just wanted to, to mention where most of this was just done. So I want to start just by a brief return, and I apologize for the people on, online, but this was a slide you saw yesterday afternoon anyways, of this amazing plot that Max showed comparing data with real simulation results uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the, the 2D hydro simulations with viscous, um, uh, like an, uh, sort of an alpha viscosity. Now, this is all from my memory, so I apologize, but this is the data I remember. And if I remember right, the fit was, was something like this, right? It got that, it captured these amazingly well. Okay, all right, well, so maybe my memory is a little bit optimistic. But the, uh, the point is <clears throat> that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't quite this good, but right, give them a, a couple of months, right? Um, so my point is that, you know, why do we still care about the, the extreme expense, both in terms of man hour time and building these big complex codes, but then also the computational expense um, and all those greenhouse gas emissions to solve the problem in full GR MHD? So that's what I'm going to try and, and talk about today. Where does the separation lie in the physics that we can get at in 2D uh, viscous hydro simulations? And what do you really need full 3D MHD for? So I won't go too much into the background of the motivation of this problem. That's what a lot of this conference has been about. But I'll just remind you that in reality, in, in real physical systems, we really don't know a priori, right, what the uh, the filling of the initial parameter space of binaries should be. So misalignment is there, the thermodynamics of the infalling gas. There are all of these three parameters, the mass ratio, the total mass of the system, the magnetic field of the gas as it's falling into these systems, which could vary by orders of magnitude, even between different systems. And, and just in general, the environment, and then all of the, you know, the three spin vectors, the total, each black hole, the orientation, there are a lot of parameters. And so for 3D germ HD simulations, we try and cut these down to at least something that is tractable to start with. Now, in the past, we've already learned uh, from work that has made these initial steps to 3D or adding magnetic fields, that as soon in, in some cases, as soon as you add a third dimension, uh, you get surprising results. Or as soon as you add a second dimension, you get surprising results, right? So, so the growth of eccentricity in the lump, I don't think those were originally predicted, right? Uh, but then in the mini disk um, tilts, which I'll show going from two to 3D, there are analogous effects uh, from two to 3D that we're just starting to see uh, compared to the prior going 1D to 2D. So there are a lot of open questions and I, this is, not an exhaustive list. We've talked about many of these here, uh, but some of them we haven't paid a whole lot of attention to. For instance, the multiplicity of disk states um, that regular AGN may go through. How do those affect the binary problem? In binary supermassive black hole systems, we would, affect, we would expect those to control some aspects of variability. But then also, what about the importance of outflows? We've talked about that a little bit, maybe in the context of um, circumstellar disks, but you know, only maybe briefly touching on it. And uh, so far, I don't think anybody has shown what the effect of radiative or, um, or especially magnetic winds in binary supermassive black hole systems might show. So in going to 3D, GR, radiative initially through post-processing, but ultimately including itself consistently, and mag magnetic simulations, um, including full um, ideal MHD, we can start to add the physics that we expect to be correlated with, uh, uh, with, the, with the birth of each of these sorts of processes. So adding MHD and radiation, you can get jets and winds with the magnetic field. You can get a, a true, maybe turbulent distribution in the circumbinary disk, which I'll show makes an effect. With radiation, you can get a spectrum, light curve, et cetera. 
If you add GR effects, then especially for close separation, you can start to get a, a handle on how the extra free parameters affect orbital evolution, that sort of thing. And then even in 3D, in the very most basic vanilla situation, there are important 3D effects that we can start to include. So this work is building on a tremendous amount of work in the past. I'm sure this is not uh, uh, you know, even com close to a uh, complete summary of the prior work. I focus mostly here on the work that has been done with grid-based codes. Um, so I, I'm sorry for the extra incompleteness in, in terms of SPH codes. But in the GR uh, MHD world, there's, there's kind of a, a spectrum of codes that go from on one end, 2D and then 3D viscous hydro equations, which we've heard a lot about. And then uh, on the complete opposite end is full up numerical relativity with MHD and probably soon radiative effects included. Now, these are extremely expensive and tens of orbits it has been a stretch. On this end, you don't have the third dimension or that extra physics, but you can get tens of thousands of orbits. So what, I, what we've been trying to do is bridge this gap. There was the earlier work by Xi et al. and Krolik, and then adding post-Newtonian evolution of the trajectories and the space-time with, uh, with Nobel et al. in 2012 and the recent updated work in 2021. And then there's this work that I've been building more directly off of, which was the setup of Bowen et al., where you take those types of uh, disks where you just evolve the circumbinary and then start to try and see what happens inside. So this is an example of one of our start sims. This is a, uh, a visualization of a disk that is tilted by 12 degrees. So we start with a hydroequilibrium torus with uh, Ploidal magnetic field loop, and we evolve starting from 43 ms uh, uh, from uh, from 43 m separation, and evolve the binary through to uh, basically until the post Newtonian breaks down, which is a factor of a few um, in closer orbits. So here, I'm zooming in on the center of the disk. The binary is speeding up, so you get the propeller effect in the visualization. And even here, you can see these under dense cavities which in one of our discussions, I think we're starting maybe to see something that could be compared to 2D simulations as well. So for 3D GRMHD of the full system, we take these uh, simulations where the central binary is excised. And then with a new code, which I've uh, been leading the development of in, in my last postdoc and with this collaboration, we can add now a, a second patch. So with horn 3D, we evolve uh, the circumbinary disk, we continue to evolve it. But once it's been evolved to an equilibrium state, we then add a central patch to cover the central cavity region and evolve that system uh, in a global way. So this is a long movie, so I'll, I'll maybe put it up at the very end during questions. But from the initial evolution, you can see that the circumbinary disk already has the lump in place. This is equal mass aligned the entire system. And this has one advantage over our prior work that I'll just mention, which is that there's full evolution of this uh, cavity region. There's no central cutout because we have a Cartesian geometry for the central patch, still spherical polar for the outer patch. And this evolution is resolved out to, um, uh, out to uh, uh, you know, evolving the entire mass reservoir of the circumbinary disk. So we start this at 20 m separation and we evolve to 9 m separation. So the very early work by Bowen et al. was able to get through a few orbits. There was extensions of that run that were published the last few years that got up to about here. We were able to run all the way through just over 30 orbits uh, into this new in-spiral regime. So on the top plot, is the mass accretion rate, the total in black, compared to a continued fixed separation run published in Nobel 2012. And then each black hole's mass accretion rate in the two colored lines. On the lower plot is an efficiency for the total accretion onto the cavity in black, the accretion efficiency of each black hole in, in the color, and then this is the accretion efficiency of the circum 
binary disk. So you may immediately notice that there's some sort of an inflection about halfway through the run. And unluckily, it coincided with right about where the prior runs ended. So this is a plot of the separation in blue. Uh, excuse me, uh, this is a plot, well, it actually tracks the separation quite well. This is a plot of the total mass in a ring around the black holes. And then in each of these lines at two different measures for the M1 mode, the lump mode, normalized by the total mass. So this is what um, Scott has talked about in his, his talk last week about a measure of the lump. And so basically at the point in the simulation where the lump starts to dissipate, the power in that mode decreases, you get uh, that, that transition zone. All right, so a couple of more movies. So this is just a poloidal slice through each of the black holes evolving at the same time and rotating in the frame of the black hole. I just show this because you can immediately see what Julian mentioned the other day, which is this sandwich structure of material that is sloshing back and forth between the two black holes. Magnetic field is shown in the field line and color density uh, is showing density. So this is a slice through that plane into the uh, end of the screen of the mass accretion rate. Julian already showed this where you have mass flux into the board and out of the board in red. And this is just a comparison of the accretion rate onto one of the black holes with the mass um, involved in the sloshing of material over to, the black, over to that black hole. So here for the first time, because the cutout was present in our prior simulations, we can really start to understand the energetics and the momentum that is carried in this mass sloshing, uh, which is very important ultimately for understanding how much an accretion episode onto one black hole influences the following accretion onto the other black hole. So this is a poloidal plot through the entire system rotating with the black holes. And I'll just draw your eyes to how much vertical structure there is in the material accreting from the circumbinary disk. In fact, you can see that this vertical structure causes a mini disk that forms, on, uh, forms and is destroyed on the orbital time period that is misaligned from the equatorial plane. So this was, I believe, completely unexpected because these are totally aligned systems. The time average of the density of the circumbinary disk and the accretion rate is in the plane. So I quantified what these tilts would look like. This is just a uh, measure of the tilt off the plane, whether it was positive or negative, I just took the absolute value. For each black hole, um, just a probability histogram of their tilts as a function of um, a tilt angle. Now, I wanted to know, originally I saw this tilt, and I didn't know exactly what the process was that was creating it, but I hypothesized that it was this off-axis accretion. So each episode of accretion dominated one, when it interacted with the lump, dominated by a blob of material coming off at some angle. So I just plotted in orange the tilt as a function of time, and in blue is, oh, excuse me, in blue is the tilt as a function of time, and in orange is the vertical offset of the, uh, the accretion um, uh, of, of material from the, uh, from the circumbinary disk. And I, I think that they, they track each other pretty well. So one of the key advantages in this run, um, how much time do I have left? Great. So one of the key advantages in this run, remember is it's full 3D GeoMHD. So we have horizons. We resolve the accretion in the mini disks okay in this run. In the outer portion, we could resolve some of the large scale of the MRI. Because it's a Cartesian grid, it has uniform vertical resolution across the central region for now, um, though we'll update that soon. And because of that, close to the black hole, the disks are maybe moderately resolved. But that's very close to the black hole. Remember, these have zero spin, so the ISCO is pretty far out. And we're in a regime where we wouldn't necessarily expect the MRI to really control much of the dynamics anyways. And in a very at all coming out, hopefully in the next handful of weeks, uh, I'll show why that's the case as well. But we can track and estimate what the magnetic field evolution would be as a function of time. 
So forget about the details of these units, but I'll just say that for a MAD disk, you would expect a value of something like 40 to 50. So a MAD disk being an accretion state in a single black hole system, typically, where you've piled on as much magnetic flux for the disk state that you can imagine. So in my mind, since I run MAD disk simulations, that's kind of like a, a bound to normalize to. So what we can see here then is that there's significant amount of magnetic flux on the horizons all the way from 20M separation through the final in spiral down to right before merger. And in fact, normalized by the mass accretion rate, there's even a little bit of an increase towards the end of this as the mass accretion rate drops off very quickly, but there's still magnetic flux on the horizons. Much more interestingly, I think, is that the orbital period is much shorter than the flips of the, the sign of the flux. So, uh, sorry, let me give a detail that if you integrate the signed magnetic flux over the northern hemisphere of one of the black holes, that's one of these lines. And then if you integrate the signed magnetic flux over the lower hemisphere, that's the other line. And if these are perfectly symmetric, that tells you that there's an, an equal, you know, symmetric representation of the flux in the north-south hemispheres. So that's why I plot both. So you, you see a few interesting features. One is there are flips in sign, but remember for this separation on the orbital period, you disrupt any mini disk that is created. So you create it, you destroy it, create it, destroy it every time you interact with the lump when you get near one. But the magnetic flux has some sort of hysteresis where there is flipping over time, kind of like a random walk, but it is sustained over several orbital periods as well. So what the way I interpret this is saying that the magnetic field on the horizons, at least at this separation, is governed in large part by the dynamics of the circumbinary disk, where that magnetic field is coming from. So I think it'd be very interesting going to wider separation to see how the magnetic field evolves. It could be governed by the dynamics of the mini disks and controlled by that part of the system, or it can be controlled by the circumbinary disk on the longer scales. So these have a lot of relevance to trying to understand if these systems will produce jets. If you take this level of magnetic flux and you give a lot of spin to the black holes, which we're doing now in our simulations, uh, then you would expect to produce a powerful jet, at least if they're vertically aligned. So just a few conclusions at this point. Uh, going to 3D GRMHD, we see unexpected and, and really the highly nonlinear behavior of the MHD evolution. And there are a few surprising results that we wouldn't have seen, right, if we were still uh, outside of this 3D germ HD regime, namely mini disk tilts. Now, they seem to be limited to the scale height in angle, the scale height of the circumbinary disk, but it's not clear if that is the case for all situations. Maybe the mini disks will be uh, more highly inclined for other pieces of parameter space, other parts of parameter space. More interesting to me even, I think, is that this means the dynamical interactions of the binary hill spheres with the thermodynamic and turbulence of the circumbinary disk is important. If you have a razor thin disk around one of the black holes and you accrete material at wider angles than that H over R, that means that incoming material is not gonna strike the outer part of the disk. It's gonna pass over the disk to some degree, spreading out over it, maybe muffling emission from it. We don't really know until we run different thermodynamic studies. So, um, right, and we also saw, interestingly, a flattening of the luminosity at the final ring down that seems to be associated with the disruption of the lump. Uh, so going to wider separation, we'll be able to tell us if the lump will still be present at this separation, uh, if that result will fully hold. So I think there are a lot of open questions still on the numerical side, we can improve the codes, which I'll just list those and not go into the details unless you ask. Uh, on the astrophysical side, there are a lot of um, ways we can improve our model and make it more physical. Very interestingly, you know, we can try different cooling prescriptions. Here, to keep the disk thin, we just use a, a Noble et al. type cooling function, keep it sort of at a fixed stage over R, but you can imagine increasing the, uh, the physicality of the thermodynamic conditions. Um, or even including ray of transport. 
And you know, I I love the study of mad accretion disks. So uh, it, it's it's not clear if you give a lot of large scale magnetic flux to a binary, what will happen. Uh, so we also uh, want to continue the study with jets and outflows, um, et cetera. And this is a radiative uh, post-processing of one of our prior simulations done by uh, Scott Noble and others. And you know we have uh, the code ready to do these types of radiative post-processing for these results. Um, so I'll just mention, are the initial conditions for these simulations realistic? Because we have to start near the inspiral regime so that we can start with the black holes close enough so that we don't have a huge separation in scale between the time scale of a binary orbit and the time scale of the event horizon, we can't go to too wide separation. So we're making code improvements to increase the efficiency even further and hope to be able to go to much wider separation and have more disky like mini disks. And I really want to utilize those simulations to start bridging this gap to the 2D regime uh, where we can really start saying, okay, <laughs> For a binary that's wide enough separation that you really get mini disks that at least qualitatively are like the 2D runs, uh, what is the 3D Durham HD show? Okay, yeah, I'll just stop there and take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Can I start with a quick question while I give Mag the, the microphone? Sure. So if you do have these black holes spinning and create jets as you're saying you think you will, what do you do? You expect to see two separate processing jets far away, or will this be something that's collimated into a single jet from the system? Just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, I think I think it's a, a, a very interesting question. Um, there should be, you know, at close separate. I think separation is one of the key pieces of the answer to that. At close separation, like this type of separation, um, and for say moderate spin, you can imagine launching an outflow that's it's relativistic, or, you know, relativistic, but not super fast. And if they're a line spin, then they would wrap around each other. And maybe topologically with, uh, uh, with um, polarization signatures of the jet, you could distinguish a single jet versus a binary jet system by having two um, helices. Um, for a wider separation or for angles of misalignment, I don't know. Uh, I think it's much more unanswered. And of course, if you have a, a you know a non-equal mass ratio, then maybe one will dominate over the other. We don't fully understand the way a magnetic field is transported in these systems. How does it get from the circumbinary disk to the mini disks? Does it stay in the mini disk? Does it get pushed onto the black hole? If there's any cyclical nature of the mini disks um, because of like interaction with the lump, then that modulation will maybe let the magnetic field leak away. So um, I think we're just starting to get some hints in that direction. Hi, this is Magda. Um, great talk. I, I was uh, wondering about something that we see in these 2D uh, hydro um, models that uh, we see that the total accretion rate of a binary is approximately equal to the total accretion rate on a, um, on a single black hole. Um, and I'm wondering um, if, I guess these simulations are too short to, uh, to check if this is the case when you include all this physics and do it in 3D, but can you maybe speculate if, uh, if this approximation would still hold um, or if, uh, if, if the physics you include there might change the picture? Yeah, so, so something that I'm trying to do with our, with our newer simulations is to, in, in all the cases where we can afford it with comp computing time and that kind of thing, have some reference uh, simulations that we compare to, either of the single black hole case or single black hole with some like time average of the space time, or, or even just staying at fixed separation to compare the running in runs to, because uh, I, I think those types of comparisons are important. Um, for the simulations that we have with the uh, central region evolved, uh, the circumbinary disk, like the entire system has not evolved long enough for any feedback uh, from the very central cavity on the very disky part of the disk that's far away. I think we've run long enough after 30 or so orbits uh, and soon maybe 50 or 100 orbits um, to reach uh, an inflow outflow equilibrium with the lump 
but improving the communication between the entire cavity system and the circumbinary disc and including the 3D germ HD effect, or excuse me, including the 3D MHD effects that probably happen at large scales like magneto dynamos and that kind of thing. Um, I think it's important to get, and I think comparison to single black hole systems is a good way to quantify the effects. And I think, I think once we hit 100 orbits, and once we start with the much more equilibrated runs that, that Scott and others in our group have run now, um, you know, I restarted from Noble 2012 runs, which were maybe halfway to full saturated equilibrium state. I, I give reasons in the, in the paper that we're, that we're about to put out, um, why those different, those particular differences should make it, shouldn't make a big difference in, uh, everything that I'm reporting, but, I think to answer your questions, we need these two steps. Longer runs by a factor of a few, which we can do, and starting with new initial conditions, which we have ready. So stay tuned. Great. We have a few more minutes, so we have one here and then two online. Yeah, uh, this is Bhupendra. Great talk, Mark. Uh, my quick question is on the magnetic flux profile you showed. Is that at the event horizon or at some larger radius? Sorry, is it at what? Is it at event horizon or it at some radius? Like, does it depend on the radius? Like yeah. Um, so, because of the way I do the analysis, I interpolate for a lot of these measures that I that I would measure in spherical polar coordinates. I do an interpolation of the data into spherical polar coordinates, and that interpolation is inaccurate by twenty or thirty percent right on the horizon. So I measure it just outside of the horizon. Um, so it is, uh, it's about halfway to the ISCO. Uh, single black hole simulations, I think, would suggest that that's a pretty robust measure of this quantity uh, for these magnetization levels. Um, but it is, it is a measure that I hope to reduce from, you know, 20 or 30 percent error if I measure exactly on the horizon down to zero. Um, I've done some convergence studies to make sure that this particular measure at halfway to the uh, halfway to the ISCO is robust, and it, it seems to be by varying the radius. Okay, Roman. Uh, right, uh, nice talk. Uh, the images you showed seem to be pretty geometrically thick, so I'm wondering uh, what is the H over R that you assumed I might have missed it during the talk, uh, and uh, you know how realistic this is. And uh, whether you do take into account radiation pressure and blowing up uh, this, uh, you know, HOR. The second question which I have is: uh, Sir Finney and Milos Milosavljevic showed that at some point, you know, when you have a disk and then the binary starts rapidly merging due to the gravitational wave emission, there should be a sort of formation of a separated cavity. So the cavity should detach from uh, the merging black hole. Uh, do you think that you might be actually starting your cavity too small? compared to this uh, regime? Um, I mean, that's just a question, please. Um, yeah, uh, so, I, so I heard the second question a little bit uh, more completely, so let me start with that, especially since I'm more prepared for it. So this is a concern. Uh, if we start at a binary at 20 m separation, but it decoupled at a much wider separation, then you, you think- right. maybe, that's my question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we start with too little gas. So I have, uh, one simulation where I start evolving at 43m separation and just making an, an analytic estimate for what the separation of decoupling from the disk should be for an H of R of 0.1, which we choose the cooling function to keep our disk at, and we start the disk at that H over R, and an alpha that I take a measurement from the, the very well uh, constrained measures from, from Scott's uh, 2021 paper of those very long simulations. Then, then you get a measure of a decoupling at about 20 or 30 m. So I started a, a simulation of the circumbinary disk, H of R 0.1, uh, with magnetic field, you know, same, same kind that I've been showing, like, like the tilted one. Uh, this was aligned, equal mass binary, and I started in spiraling it from 43 m separation. And this is the separation, uh, you know, starting at 43 m, this is the mass accretion rate in blue, and there's this sudden drop, which coincides at, you know, say about 25 in separation, smack dab in the middle of the range that we would predict. So I think this is suggestive that we're starting just past decoupling. If you, if you, 
you know, take this simulation at face value. But the mass accretion rate, even at 9N separation, has only been reduced by 50%. Uh, so 50% reduction, we would expect still, you know, basically the qualitative conditions of the disk haven't changed. One caveat, this disk did not start after hundreds of orbits. I started the in spiral uh, right at the beginning of the simulation, and so it reached 100 orbits about here. Um, and so maybe the lump and the uh, circumbinary disk wasn't fully evolved. So I'm about two thirds of the way running a simulation that we started at 43M separation, uh, but started with a, a fully equilibrated disk. The lump was present and saturated, et cetera. And uh, there still seems to be mass, um, but stay tuned. Um, uh, should have results from that soon. So far, it looks like there, there should be gas and, and lump present, but really need to keep going. Um, first question, I think maybe I covered uh, H of R of 0.1 in the disk. We cool the mini disk regions and the circumbinary disk to the same thermal state, expectation of H of R 0.1, but we're starting to vary exactly the time scale over which we cool uh, the H of R's that we consider and whether an asymmetric H of R makes a difference. So what, what is this H of R realistic in physical systems? Yeah, so, so point one we choose to, to be consistent with, say, you know, a lot of the AGN literature. I, I, I think a mildly sub-Eddington system is, is uh, at least personally from, from, from what I've seen, it, it seems like a, a reasonable choice for some uh, systems that are in, you know, a, a high state. Um, we will continue to push to thinner disks uh, as we have the computational resources for. All right, let's okay. give Mark another round of applause. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. <laughs>